There's a very intentional push around soccer right now in the lead up to the 2026 World Cup. We're three years out. MLS has long been seen behind NHL, but I think Messi is such a game-changing signing. MLS is legitimately in the conversation in a way they haven't been. So the field is going to be 48 teams. It's going to be the biggest World Cup ever. Put me on record. Every viewership record will be broken. It's going to be huge. Welcome to The Peel, where we explore the world's greatest startup stories. I'm your host, Turner Novak, founder of Banana Capital, a venture capital firm with the highest email newsletter open rate. Today, I talked to Kendall Baker. Currently, Kendall leads Yahoo's sports newsletter business. In 2017, he launched the first daily sports newsletter called Sports Internet, which he sold to Axios in 2019. Before Sports Internet, he convinced the founders of The Hustle to focus their online tech blog on a daily newsletter, which he wrote for a year and a half. Before The Hustle, he produced SportsCenter at ESPN. He spent nearly a decade at the intersection of daily news and sports, and this episode is packed with insights on both. We talked about the history of the newsletter industry and why the best writers delete more than they write. He gives us a crash course on the sports media and newsletter businesses and shares how he secretly got on SportsCenter in 2015. He tells us how he got his very first dollars of sponsorship revenue for Sports Internet and why he decided to spend zero dollars on growth. We talked through the process of selling Sports Internet to Axios, why the commissioner of the NBA reads Kendall's writing, why he thinks Yahoo is the next rocket ship, the surging momentum in U.S. soccer, and the most underrated athletes today and of all time. Thanks to Kendall for coming on the show and to all the anonymous sports VIPs for their great questions. Now, let's jump in after a short word from SecureFrame. Longtime listeners know SecureFrame is the automated compliance platform built by security experts. I'm an investor in SecureFrame, and I highly recommend it to every founder I meet. A founder friend of mine, JJ Tang at Rootly, used SecureFrame to get SOC 2 compliant in two weeks. Today, Rootly helps massive organizations like Cisco, NVIDIA, and Shell manage engineering incidents across their entire organization. But back when Rootly launched, signing publicly traded companies as a seed stage startup would have been impossible without SecureFrame's automated compliance software designed by security experts. Thousands of other customers like Ramp, Angelus, and Coda trust SecureFrame to get, stay, and automate their compliance with security and privacy frameworks like SOC 2, ISO 2701, HIPAA, GDPR, and more. Check the link in the show notes to get set up on a demo with its in-house team of compliance experts and former auditors. Thank you, SecureFrame. And now let's talk to Kendall Baker. Kendall, how's it going? Thanks for joining me today. It's good, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. I've been a observer slash reader of your content for a while. Can you kind of give us a history of just this whole newsletter industry and maybe specifically what's going on in sports also, if that's relevant? Sure. Yeah. So I think I can speak to the newsletter industry pretty well, just because I've kind of been there for a few of the different stages that I've seen. I guess I'd start with saying the first time I became kind of aware of newsletters as a business model and not just kind of like something that a media company has or something that somebody writes, but as a foundational piece of a business, if not the entire business, was the skim. I had a a friend working there. This was... um, See, I graduated college 2013, probably around right when I graduated college is when I first became aware of it. And what was the skim? The skim was one of the first newsletters that was really kind of a daily newsletter product, taking the biggest headlines, explaining to you, you know, why they matter. Very brief. It was definitely targeted towards women more so. But they were the first really big, I would say, success story in terms of a daily news-based newsletter that was really their entire business. They ended up building some things around that, but still to this day, it's very much like the, their core business model. And that was the first time I became aware of that 2013. And I was actually working at ESPN at the time. And funny enough, which, you know, I ended up launching a sports daily newsletter. But at that time, I had the thought of what if you did this, but for sports? So that was always kind of in the back of my mind and ended up acting on it later. But that was kind of so, so 2013, I'd say it was when you see kind of the skim. And I think there were a few others that were starting to pop up like, oh, wow, you can build an entire business around a newsletter. You can have a pretty lean team, but also probably bigger than people think if it's just this one product. So that's 2013. Two years later, I ended up at a company called The Hustle, which at the time was a blog. We had like four employees. It was a tiny business and a little apartment essentially in San Francisco. And our newsletter at the time was more what you would see back then, which was 
hey, here's the best articles we wrote this week. It was more of a curated list of our stuff as opposed to like original reporting that you hadn't seen elsewhere. And I actually pitched the founders of the business on, hey, what if we did like a daily newsletter um, where we just covered the day's headlines, kind of like the skim's doing. And uh, there was a few others at the time. So we ended up launching that 2016. And that's where I'd say you, you start to see more the skim copycats or just more businesses realizing that, hey, we have, you know, we're creating a ton of content and then we're putting that stuff into a newsletter and sending it. What if we just sent the newsletter? And I think you saw a lot more businesses realize you could have a leaner team, you know, in many ways cut through the noise. I think one reason why newsletters have been so effective is people realize, oh, everybody's kind of overwhelmed with information, even your own content. If they're a big fan of your content, why don't you just give them the best stuff to begin with that you can build an entire business around it? So that's 2015. You start to see more copycats. So what was the business model then at the time? Did you just get a bunch of eyeballs, certain amount of opens for email and you can kind of monitor? with advertising exactly and and at the time and i think to to a certain extent this is still the case if not even more so you could just get higher cpm rates on newsletters so if your business was hey we have a blog and we're selling banner ads if you essentially then say well we're actually going to pivot to a newsletter create similar content obviously a little shorter tighter you're going about it in a different way where you're sending one thing versus publishing multiple articles throughout the day you could essentially run the same business with more eyeballs ideally and higher cpm rates so it was a kind of an easy pivot for some folks. That's fascinating. Why were the CPMs higher? It doesn't it, it doesn't make sense. It's a great question and I think many people would have many different answers. I think my assessment is there was already starting to be and it's definitely even more so now this sense around the industry that nobody was looking at banner ads. I think there was even like studies that came out that was like our eyeballs are now trained to block them out. Nobody's looking at them. And I think there was something still and again it still feels like this is the case that was like kind of new and exciting about newsletters, more of a community community, people were reading it. It was more of a habit. And I think a lot of it also was with newsletters, you could kind of create more of a voice for your brand. And I think advertisers were really, really interested in putting themselves in that newsletter that you're creating that really had a, a voice, really had a connection with the reader. And that reader was opening it almost at a habit if you're doing a good job, you know, every morning with their coffee, as opposed to maybe coming to your site. But there was something I think attractive to advertisers about being aligned with this product, as opposed to maybe a website. Yeah, there's probably an aspect of the reason Facebook and Instagram ads do so well is people habitually open the app exactly. many, many times a day. Email is probably the same, where if you send someone an email, they might not open it, but they'll see that you sent them an email and they'll, they're always returning. So you can almost guarantee that people will read it and see it. I mean, look, what I've always said about daily newsletters specifically, and this applies certainly to weekly and whatever cadence you do, but but daily, a daily newsletter in my mind is the most habit-forming media product there is, even more than a daily podcast, because you know, a, a newsletter somebody can open on their own time. They can use it in the way they want. They want to read every word. They want to read just the top story. They want to read something and they end up down a rabbit hole. It's more kind of choose your own adventure. And I think people are much more likely to kind of open that out of habit every morning. I have so many readers who tell me I read, you know, I read your newsletter every day over coffee or I read your newsletter every day on the train to work or whatever it is. They know when to expect it. It shows up in an app that they check frequently. And it also shows up in an app alongside their coworkers, their boss, their mom. It's just kind of comes to them in a place that feels very organic and very much kind of one to one. So back to kind of the history of newsletters, 2015, uh, you see a lot of companies, uh, media companies starting to use newsletters as their core business or one of their core business revenue streams. And then I'd say between 2015 and now, there's been this shift. So, so first there was a shift to media companies are doing this, you know, small to medium size, maybe some big, big media companies. What if I did this on my own? What if I did this with two, three people, really small one to three person operations that realize, okay, we can kind of create an entire news based media company with just a handful of employees. I mean, that's how Morning Brew started. That's how I started Sports Internet, which ended up getting acquired by Axios. It was basically, hey, I can kind of do the entire day's news myself or two people or three people. And newsletters were the perfect media for that. So I think I'd say between 2017, maybe 2019, 2016, 2019, you started to see more people, whether they were ex-reporters at media companies or didn't really have any experience journalistically, quite frankly, um, realized that they could start up, spin up a daily newsletter and, and grow it pretty effectively. And then I'd say the biggest change I've seen has been within the last four years, which I've kind of observed from afar because I've been working at a, a media company and not really in the weeds, but definitely interested and, and, and following very closely, which is now you have tools like Substack, you have tools like Beehive that have made it 
way easier to start newsletters, first of all. They've also created a network effect that you saw happen with podcasts where you have, you know, what are the top newsletters? You can see that on Substack in a way that you couldn't before. You can discover new ones in a way you couldn't before. So there's this ecosystem that's been created and these tools that have been created that make it extremely easy to start a newsletter and not just start it, but then find similar newsletters, share audience with those people. And so what is kind of gradually become apparent to people is that newsletters are a very effective medium. And what's happened recently is it's just become incredibly easy to start one. And I wouldn't say incredibly easy, but much easier to grow it and find new readers. And I think people are just very interested in newsletters in a way that they weren't before in terms of kind of from a discovery standpoint. What makes a good daily newsletter or just newsletter in general? There's a few things. I'd I'd probably say one, and this applies more to some people than others. I think it depends on your subject matter. But I think pairing a daily newsletter with a very distinct voice is extremely effective. Like I said before, you're sliding into people's inboxes, if you will. You're, sli- you're sliding into their DMs. And often, you know, a lot of newsletters come from your name. You know, some people still have it come from their company, but for mine at Axios, for example, came from Kendall Baker. And so, you know, you have somebody getting essentially an email from you. Why not lean into personality? Now, I covered sports and that's easier. I think if I were covering politics, for example, maybe you don't lean as much into that because, you know, if you're you're a political reporter, you don't want to feel, you don't want to be the story. You want to be as unbiased as possible. So I think, you know, that gives you an example of like where it works better than, than others. But there's always a way to kind of sneak your voice into there, make it personal and, um, as somebody who's been writing newsletters forever and anybody who has been doing it can relate to this, people can reply right to you. And so again, leaning into voice, leaning into like, hey, there's a human on the other end of this. I can't tell you how many people over the years will reply to my newsletter and then I'll reply back to them and, and they'll be like, oh my gosh, like you replied. I'm like, yeah, this is my email. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And uh, it's actually funny. Like the, the, the best ones are when somebody replies, you know, hating on you or telling you how dumb this thing was. And then I'll reply like, thanks for the feedback, like really appreciate it or something longer than that. And then they all get back to me. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean, you know, it's like it, it, <laughs> oh, the funniest interaction always because they expect yeah. like most things, they don't expect a response. They And maybe they don't even think it's anybody's going to ever see this. They're kind of just getting it out, <laughs> whatever they need to get out. And then I come back to them with like a nice little message and then they immediately retract it. That actually helps though boost your deliverability in their inbox, right? Like when people reply. Deliverability for sure. Like, but, but also just the second somebody has a conversation with you, they feel even closer to you. And I don't have exact data to back this up, but I promise you people who have interacted with me on my newsletter, they, they've replied, I've gotten back to them. They, they become much more loyal subscribers because now they feel like a connection with me. And there's actually, you know, I had, I had one guy over the course of the last essentially five years reply to almost every single one of my newsletters. And so I've never met him, but we have this kind of like pen pal like relationship. There's another person who for a three month span would grade every one of my newsletters on a scale of one to 10. <laughs> Uh, and it was just like kind of awesome. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't want to read too much into it. It's one person, but when he gave me a, like a low score, like I definitely was like, okay, like maybe something to consider, but was it just a pure number or would he be like, I give you a five because of this or a 10? So sometimes there was like a reason, but other times it was simply just like (laughs) (laughs) 8.2. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty awesome. But, but so, so that just kind of gives you a sense of like the relationship you can build with a reader, with a newsletter. And back to my point of voice, like if you're going to have, if you're going to build that relationship and lean into that relationship, you should lean into who you are. I think another thing that makes a daily newsletter effective, and this is very on brand for my previous employer, Axios, but it's true, uh, make it short. First of all, over half of email subscribers, and this is data I've seen, it could be different depending on who you are, over half are reading on their phone. Um, and so if you think about, and this is true for article, any, anything, any, any reading being done on someone's phone, if they can't see the bottom of the paragraph they're reading, there's a much higher chance that they're going to jump ship because that's just how attention works now. If somebody, the second somebody gets bored, if you're not immediately jumping them to the next thing, jumping them to the next thing, getting to the next thing, the chances of them leaving is much higher. And I think emails, newsletters, there's so many of them now. A lot of people are inundated with them. If you're not able to kind of deliver them your message effectively, efficiently, and kind of communicate to them like, hey, I value your time. I know you're busy. And that's why this is short. That's why this is the point. Um, I think it's really helpful. I think people have a bad habit of writing too long you know, kind of getting too obsessed with their own words. And I've kind of grown to kind of be obsessed with deleting my own words and treating newsletters like every pixel matters, if you will. You know, one of the great things about newsletters is they're extremely bare bones and they're extremely limiting. 
You know, some people will complain, oh, I wish I could embed video in my newsletter. I wish I could do all these things. And yeah, that would be great. But I think there's something to be said for the fact you can't do that. So therefore, you have to focus on the written content, on the images, on every small little detail. And what happens is you end up treating it more like a piece of art than just like a blog post. And I think that goes hand in hand with length. If you're really intentional about every word you put in that newsletter, every image, everything is just really thought through, you create something that's just a real joy to read. And um, people can kind of look forward to reading it in a way that people these days don't look forward to reading much because everything is, not everything, but there's still a lot of things that are just really long. You know, it's, it's a hard truth for us to accept as writers, but like there's a very good chance people are going to bail on you after the first paragraph. Yeah, it's very counterintuitive. But probably the top advice I get from or feedback I get from anyone on how to be a good writer is write less. I mean, it's true. And I think, you know, like you take the New York Times, for example, love the New York Times, but the New York Times almost trains writers in a way that they train writers to write for newspapers. If, if you look at a typical New York Times story, the first paragraph is kind of like it's the person trying to win a Pulitzer Prize. In my opinion, that's how I describe it to people. It's like perfect words, big words, beautiful, beautiful prose. But like the, the point of the story doesn't start till like the second paragraph in. That's how newspaper writing was done. You know, you have to almost go long. To, to get on the front page, you have to go long. Whereas I think that's actually counterintuitive now. The best advice I give to people is like, no, actually, instead of starting with that long, winding, nicely put together paragraph, why don't you just start with what people click the headline for, which is like what happened or what's important. And I mean, again, very on brand with my for an employer, but actually part of the reason why I joined Axios is I very much agree with this way of thinking, which is people are busy. The most important thing you can do to create brand loyalty with readers is just like value their time. It's interesting when you talk about the New York Times, like there'll be times where I will read some, I don't know, New York Times, CNN, I don't know, legacy publication is, I don't know how to refer to them. And there's just some super juicy stat or thing that's like buried two thirds of the way through. You can reverse engineer this. So, you know, obviously in this example, I'm about to give the New York Times did the hard work. And so they deserve credit for it. And of course, you know, nothing irks me more than when people essentially take something from somewhere else and make it very vague that they got it mm -hmm. from that source. Like be upfront with the fact that, you know, it's via the New York Times. Like that's very easy to do. And you'd be surprised how many places they'll do it. But like to, to, to use your example, you know, if I read an article like that in New York Times, and it's a 1500 word piece, and there was one stat in the middle that was like jaw dropping, how I would reverse engineer that would be I'd share the stat and then tell people if you'd like to read the whole article, go here. Yeah. Right. Because some people want to read the whole article. Great. But like if you surface the most interesting point, most people aren't going to read the full, full article, but at least they got that from it. And then the per people who do want to read the full article make it very easy for them to do so. It's kind of simple when you think about it, but there are you know reasons why publications don't do this. And I, and I understand those reasons, but I just think if you're writing on the internet these days, the single most important thing you can do is just learn to write shorter and learn to be more efficient with your words. It is good feedback. And after talking with us for a couple of minutes, it's made me reflect. I can probably <laughs> cut a little shorter. I have a weekly newsletter. That's probably mm -hmm. how like about half the people who listen to the podcast get it from the newsletter. It's it's not black and white. And I also think that weekly, you know, maybe people are looking for something different. Like I speak a lot to daily newsletters. That's what I've been doing. And that is really, you really have to value people's time because they're busy. They're usually reading in the morning before they get to work. They want efficiency. They want, like my readers for the most part want talking points so that when they talk to their friends at work that day or whatever, like they, they're up to speed, they're ready to talk about stuff. Weekly newsletters, you know, you can think about more like magazines maybe. And therefore writing longer is necess isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you set the expectation of we, all of our content is very long. Have you ever listened to the Acquired podcast? Yes, I have. So they do like three, four hour episodes. You're not going to finish those quick. And you right. know, like you, right. you're going to learn the history starting from the 1800s of some massive company. And it's going to be a thrill, interesting along the way, but it's not quick. You'll learn a lot. It, they're all really, it, they're all very well done. And I know, I mean, they told me to cut so much. Like they'll go yeah. in and they'll record for a day, yeah. multiple days, and they'll cut it down to three or four hours. So I think it's, it's just like you want to keep your content high quality. High quality. And I think you made a really good point. Set the expectation. You know, as long yep. as the expectation set, great. Uh, I'll give one more example, like the Acquired podcast or some of these podcasts. You know, you see like uh, accounts like Podcast Notes pop up who've made a whole kind of account based out of, I'll go listen to that three-hour podcast because you're probably not going to, or you don't, at least not the full three hours, and I'll give you the highlight. And that's kind of back to my original point. It's like, if you're creating content that somebody then is going to go and then boil down to the talking points, isn't that signaling to you that you could just do the talking points? It's interesting, though, because it's a growth channel for that podcast where they don't do anything. They just put it out sure. and someone else does the work of, hey, listen to this episode. That's good. Very true. So it's an interesting trade off. 
Sometimes I read the uh, Business Insider's format is like headline and then like they'll do like three to four bullets of basically the, the highlights of the story you're about to read. And sometimes I'm like, so why should, you know, I think I'm good now. <laughs> yeah. Well, then they throw the paywall on you too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think one of my one of my best tweets ever is if I ever get canceled, I just hope it's on Business Insider because no one will read it. I love that. If I do ever get canceled, that's that's my hope that no one sees it. So an- another question I have just in the newsletter in general, how do you think about analytics versus intuition? Because Substack has okay analytics. They probably expand on what was there. And then when you look at a new product like BI, you can get very, very analytical, almost to the point where it's maybe not helpful. There's t- just tons you can do with it. You could probably smash your head against the wall for days just diving in all your analytics. How do you think about the artistic creativity side and then also just the pure numbers? It's a great question. I think your your point there, I would echo, which is with anything, I think, for the most part, if you get too into the numbers, you're going to drive yourself crazy. I think ultimately your content is going to speak to the fact that you're too into the numbers. It's kind of more robotic. Going back to my point from before of leaning into personality, I think that goes hand in hand with the artistic versus analytical side of just kind of like trusting your gut, seeking feedback from readers, doing things that aren't necessarily like analytics based or even scalable, quite frankly trying to respond to as many people as possible. I think all goes in the same bucket of just like art versus analytics. Now, obviously, some analytics are very important. Depends on what your newsletter is and what your KPIs are, obviously. At Axios, for example, you know we have open rate, which is extremely important. You also have click-through rate, which is extremely important. How many people click a link, right? Open rate is how many people open the email. Click-through rate is percentage that actually interact. Exactly. Now, what's interesting, though, is with the click-through rate, right? Click-through rate obviously shows very uh, like high engagement, right? Because that shows somebody didn't just open it. They're clicking something. like They're clearly engaged. However, my newsletter at Axios, one could argue, if I do a really good job, people shouldn't have to click on anything, right? Because a lot of times, if they're clicking on something, I say, hey, here's the full, you know, go deeper if you'd like. If I do my job, they do click. I don't know. You could argue that like if my click-through rate's zero, it's perfect newsletter, right? So yes. <laughs> it would, and but there were plenty of times where I was like, hey, guys, go read this article. Or, hey, go look at this highlight. So that's one metric that just an example I would use of like, hard to really read that, right? I don't really know what I'm optimizing for there. There's plenty of newsletters where the whole goal is to get people to the bottom and click off and go to whatever. And so if that's what your goal is, then looking at that, not just click through rate, but you can see how many people click that specific link, then obviously you want that as high as possible. So email is relatively minimal in terms of the analytics you can get. You're not going to get a heat map in the way you can with a website. You can't see where people are spending their time. You can really just see how many people opened it, who opened it, what they click on. And so leaning into that as much as you can without driving yourself crazy is obviously a smart thing to do. For instance, I I found it much more valuable over the years in terms of kind of feedback, in terms of shaping the newsletter to just straight up ask my subscribers via poll or via asking them to just reply to me directly like, hey, like, what do you want to see more of? What do you want to see less of? And I know that's not the most effective way maybe on paper to get data and get feedback, but I just found that to be extremely helpful and also signals to your subscribers, hey, you're part of this too. You know, if you're just on the back end looking at your dashboard, reading the analytics all the time, you're not really involving your readers in that. Whereas if you're asking them every month, hey, like, what was your favorite story this month? What did, what did you like? What didn't you like? Or things like that, then they feel like they're part of it. Over time, have found that to be much more valuable. Let's say, for example, you never covered soccer, but you're, and so based on the analytics, no one's ever clicked a soccer link. You don't know that anyone wants soccer, but if someone's like, hey, put some soccer in there, and then it starts doing really well, it shows up in the data, you would never know. And again, the, this would, a good example of why writing shorts so great is that I, what I was told, like if people that don't like soccer, and I cover every sport, so to an extent, everybody's got their sports they like, sports they don't like. Most of my subscribers, I'd argue, like all sports because that's what I'm doing. But the stories are so short that if you're scrolling and the third story is about soccer and you couldn't care less, you take your thumb and you scroll. One scroll, yeah. That's what I tell people all the time, like, oh, why are you covering this? I'm like, just scroll past it. Because your newsletter always sort of reminded me of newsletter version of Sports Center. I love that. That, that was my that was my initial like how I to, like marketed it because I mean Sports Center back in the day I mean I was born in 1991 so grew up That's in it. you know 90s early 2000s was where wake up at 5 a.m. in Canada uh, we had TSN was the name of it I oh think yeah it was the, the Sports Network and yep. then ESPN was in the U.S. Yep. And it was actually awesome because it's mostly hockey in Canada. So right. that was the interesting thing of moving to the U.S. was all of a sudden they start showing all these other sports. And I was like, I don't care about baseball. I don't care about like all these other things. Just show me an hour of hockey highlights. 
which was the interesting difference with Canada. It was probably 50 minutes of hockey. They'd show like five minutes from each game. And at the very end, they'd be like, oh yeah, the Super Bowl happened. And like, I don't know, like <laughs> LeBron dunked or like, you know, they wouldn't care about it. I grew up watching Sports Center. You know, they, they would they would just replay Sports Center all day. I, I would watch Sports Center like three times a day. But also, you know, at that time, we weren't getting you weren't finding out who won the game right when it ended, right? You didn't. You actually turned tuned into Sports Center that night or that morning, and like you didn't know what happened yet. And that was a magical time. That that and waking up and reading the sports page. Like I have so much nostalgia for that because I would wake up and be like, I don't know, like who won? You know, read like obsess over the stats. Whereas now we do that right away. Obviously, we see the viral. We we, we see Messi's goal five seconds after it happens we don't have to wait but i i will say like what still is valuable to people is putting everything in one place when people read my newsletter if they've already heard about half the stuff that's fine they already saw the messy goal for example but if i can add that one piece of context something that that they hadn't heard related to that then that's still beneficial for them they're still going to find something they didn't know but it is interesting you say that because yeah when i first started uh sports internet which is what axios acquired and kind of this this journey I've been on. Part of the reason was, you know, I had um, been a sports nerd my whole life. I worked at uh, Bleach Report, ESPN, right out of school. When I was working at The Hustle was the first time that I either wasn't, a, a, you know, a kid or in college or working in sports media. And it was actually, so it was the first time I was like, well, like, it's kind of hard to follow sports if you don't have the time to do it or you're not literally working in sports media. And I remember I texted a bunch of my friends. I'm like, hey, like, do you guys ever watch SportsCenter anymore? And for the most part, and this is when we're like 24, 20, 23, 24, for the most part, I was like, no, nah, I don't have time for that. And I was like, well, what if I basically took what's in SportsCenter and put it in a newsletter and send it to you in the morning? You could read it on the way to work. And all my friends are like, oh, I'd, I'd check that out. So that's quite literally how it started. That was literally the founding moment. Do you remember what triggered that idea in your mind? It was literally me being like, for the first time, literally the first time in my life, I was like, I kind of feel not in the know about sports because I'm writing the hustle newsletter covering tech startups. And so I was spending so much of my time in that world. And um, I love sports. And for the first time, literally in my life, I was like out of the loop. Uh, and so as many people say, over the, you know, I kind of created, uh, solved a problem that I was experiencing myself. It turns out a lot of people felt the same. Interesting. Okay. So maybe we, re we rewind just slightly. You were working at Bleacher Report and ESPN. Did you learn about the media business there or any, any interesting insights those couple of years? Certainly. I mean, so Bleach Report, I was writing and I was also, it was like my first job out of school, I was writing. I was also just doing kind of like whatever they needed. I was like helping with like graphics. How did you get that job at Bleach Report? Because that seems like a college kid who loves sports, just like a dream first job. I actually, the job I took right out of college at Bleach Report was almost unpaid. <laughs> it was very low, but they had, what, what was interesting about it was they had, it was a job that came with a program to like learn how to become a sports writer. So I wasn't just writing, I was being taught. Wasn't Bleacher Report, their model was sort of this like distributed network of sort of college students? Certainly at the early stages. So I came there uh, 2013 when I graduated from Penn. It was a very interesting time where Bleacher Report had just been acquired by Turner. And so Leisure Bar was in this, this place where they were still kind of this glorified blog with a lot of unpaid contributors, but they were also now hiring, you know, Howard Beck, Kevin Ding, like these, these known sports writers. And so they were kind of in the middle of like blog and like legit sports media publication, which they've become more and more of. And obviously they're very linked with like Turner and NBA and things like that. They were kind of like balancing the two things at the same time. But on the on the point of my first job out of college, like one thing I, I I talk to kids in college all the time who want to work in sports, and I've found this to be true when I talk to other people, other of my colleagues and people in sports that have been doing this for a while. I think working in sports, whether it's sports media or anything in sports, is one of those things that, for whatever reason, it, it, you almost at the time feel like you were not taking your you're you're not taking like career seriously because of course like everybody wants to work in sports, right? Like I went through this thing. When I was like, am I just doing this because this is like cool or am I just doing this because like it sounds fun? Like it, it almost feels like it couldn't be a serious career because, you know, everybody wants to work in sports, you know? And I had to get, kind of go through this whole thing where I really like convinced myself, no, like you like this much more than the average person. You And, and there's serious careers to be had in here. So it, it is kind of this weird thing. I'm sure there's other examples, but sports, for whatever reason, it just feels not serious enough. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, that's true. And I think the episode we published right before this one was with Dan Porter at Overtime. And we we talk about a lot of people don't even realize there's a business behind sports. And if you take it another step up, the business of sports has basically held the cable bundle together 
while it collapses alongside the internet. Like it's so important. It's so powerful. Here's another thing I'll say to that. And I know, I know Dan agrees because I'm sure we both talk to a lot of people. Like a lot of kids in college will come to me and be like, I want to work in sports. And my answer all the time is like, well, that's not a job because people think that sports is a career. But I think sports is actually just an umbrella under which there are many careers. So like you want to work in sports. Well, my answer usually is, so do you want to be a writer? Do you want to sell tickets? Do you want to work? You know, like, like sports is not a skill. And I think sports is so interesting and people are so into sports that they just say, I want to work in sports, but that's not actually helpful, right? Yeah. Because what do you want to do? You could, you know, you, you want to uh, be a sales, you want to do marketing, do you want to do podcast, you know, sport, sports is not a career. And I think people get that confused a lot because again, it's like what they're passionate about. And then they're like, that's what I want to do. But you got to think narrow down like, no, what skills do you want to develop? What do you want to do? And then try and apply that within the world of sports. So then after Bleacher Report, was it, were you thinking like, I want to stick in sports? Like, is that how the ESPN thing, how did that all, how did that job switch happen? Yeah, no, definitely wanted to stay in sports. And um, so I ended up going to ESPN, which is like a dream of mine forever and went to ESPN. And there was a little bit of a change in terms of now, I was now um, working in production, basically working in TV. I was in a rotational program there, which is really cool. We got to do a bunch of different jobs. I did everything from deciding the top 10 plays of the day to cutting highlights for games as they happen to literally running the teleprompter with my hand uh, during okay. Sports Center. Wait, um, so you, you have to turn the, th the thing that yeah. they're reading? The a little dial and you're, you're, you're kind of, and, and you, you keep up with their pacing. And as you work with certain anchors more, you start to learn. How, but it's, it's a pretty, like the, the, and there's this live also. Oh, it's live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think we had probably a week worth of like training where somebody was doing a nice set next to them and watched. And you, you know, you have the you have your headset on, you got the producer in your ear, you're kind of following the show. And obviously there are certain segments where they don't need the teleprompter, but many of them do. It's when they're, you know, they're looking directly at the camera and are doing some sort of thing they've written. But the, the first day that I had to do that by myself is the most nervous I've ever been in my entire life. Really? <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, I was just so nervous that I was going to click the wrong screen or, you know, I, I just like if you messed that up and Scott Van Pelt is like on live TV and all of a sudden like it goes dark or you're past where he's trying to read. I mean, you're going to your your mistake is going to be very visible and then they're yeah. going to be. Pissed. So I was just so nervous. Thankfully, um, I didn't have any big screw ups, but. That was a really cool job. You know, I, this show, I worked a lot on Sports Center. It was this show that I grew up obsessing over. And all of a sudden, I'm now kind of part of it and seeing how it's made. And probably shouldn't, shouldn't admit this, but whatever. Um, so the ESPN studio, there's like glass behind where the anchor desk is. And you can kind of see where I, as the production assistant, and a few other people are sitting in the back. One of the first shows that I was working on, I texted my friends. I was like, watch Sports Center tonight, and I'm going to raise my hand in the back. And so like, you see, you, know, you watch Sports Center, you, and then you just see me like, and like, <laughs> like, I saw you. Nice. Um, but you know, so so that was I think the the coolest part about the ESPN experience for me was getting to see how the sausage was made, essentially. Hmm. Well, the other the other big thing that happened to ESPN for me was, was the first time I worked somewhere surrounded by fellow kind of sports obsessed people. But I was told by numerous people there that I was more obsessed with sports than any of the, you know, so it, it was, dude, you like really love this stuff from someone who loves it. And I think, you know, hearing that confirmed to me that I was making the right career decision. And it also gave me the confidence to, I don't know, just gave, it just felt like it was giving me the green light to like go as far as I wanted in this world, because I was, I was clearly very passionate about it and not just on, on par with the other people at ESPN, but like, they were like, dude, like you, you're like crazy a little bit. I've had some of those moments too, or someone that you maybe really respect or look up to. They're like, you should actually really pursue this more. Yeah. Or you're, you're good at it. It definitely is. It's a, I don't want to say it's an ego boost. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's, it's a confidence boost. It just kind of confirms to you that you're in the right field, I think. And again, going back to my point about people who want to pursue sports, I think it's one of those things you assume, well, everybody loves sports. Everybody's obsessed with sports, right? Or at least, you know, of, of people who are sports fans, we all love sports. But if somebody's like, well, yeah, but like you are like even more into it, it's just something that, was really important for me to hear early on that stopped any questioning in my mind that I was that I wanted to work in sports. And then you left sports. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you do that? My friend was working at the skim at this yep. time. And I got this idea of what if he did a sports newsletter in my mind? This was in uh, 2013. 
that sparked an interest in me in like, how do you start a me media company? Was this when you were still at Bleacher Report? I'm trying to remember timelines. This was at ESPN, early ESPN. So like okay. end of 2013, I was at Bleacher Report pretty, pretty short time. Okay. 2013, 2014. So I just, it just planted this idea in my head of like, I would love to like start a newsletter or like just like a media company, but I had no idea how to do any of that. I also grew up in New Jersey, went to school in Philly. I was living in Connecticut. So starting a media, starting a business was in my head. And also like, I got to get out of this. I want, I want to live somewhere else. My brother-in-law was also from San Francisco. He's like, you'd love San Francisco. So everything was like startups, West coast. It was like, I should go to San Francisco and I should work at a startup and I should like learn media. I obviously thought about sports media. I, I would ideally would have loved to stay in sports media to do this, but I ended up finding the hustle, which was not sports at all, but it was very much a startup. Like I said, I think three, four employees maybe. And I really liked their voice and kind of what they were doing. And so I took that job primarily to learn the media business still with the idea of like, I want to start a sports media company sometime. So, it, it, you know, I got out of sports media, but I stayed in media and I think you can learn the media business regardless of the content. So question, what's the difference between sports media and let's say like finance, politics, technology, media, like are there differences or are they all pretty much the same? The core model of any media company is relatively the same. I think I'd say if you're comparing it to finance, for example, I think sports is still much more in the entertainment side of things versus finance where a lot of the readers are professionals. A lot of the readers are looking for... I don't know. Well, I'm going to disagree. I feel like a lot of the finance, at least the mass market finances... I think somebody who covers finance has a much better chance of getting people to pay for their content, let's say they do like a newsletter and they charge 10 bucks a month. If their value prop to that reader is you're going to pay me money, but you're going to make more money because you're going to take what I tell you. And yeah, that's fair. If I'm covering sports, unless I'm covering sports betting and my value prop is I'm going to give you picks and you're going to go make, like I'm not promising you some return on your investment, essentially. I think mm. ultimately a lot of sports news at the end of the day is just headlines and entertainment. There's nothing yep. wrong with that. But I just think that sports traditionally, and I think this is why actually the sports newsletter space, part of the reason why I launched my newsletter was like, nobody's doing this. I think part of the reason why you haven't seen the same innovation in sports and newsletters happen in sports as you have in finance or politics is that people just assume that sports fans are not in their inbox. Whereas, you know, finance or business news, people are like, oh, they're going to read at work because it's helping them get better at their job. Whereas sports still exists in this entertainment space for the most part. And sports is probably one of the broadest forms of entertainment. You know, TV is kind of the bundles kind of eroding, but if you just look at what are the most watched TV events or entertainment events. It's mostly the NFL. And then there's like a little bit of NBA and maybe like one tennis and like the World Cup. And that's basically like the top. I'm sure I would, I'm sure a lot of people have seen these these stats and I might be getting this slightly wrong. But I think last year of the 100 most watched TV broadcasts, 87 were sports. And I also think what's interesting about sports is it's the most naturally verticalized media sphere, if you will. So sports, you have sports at large, but then you have NFL or like football, college football. Like you have all these leagues, all these sports that have specific fans. Like some people just like the NFL. Some people just like college football. Some people only like soccer. And so there's media spheres for all of these sports. If somebody was starting a sports media company, and let's say you wanted to lean into newsletters, it's already verticalized for you. You, you launch a newsletter with everything, and then you have an NFL newsletter, NBA newsletter, Major League Baseball. So there's very natural sub verticals within sports which is also how you make more money as a newsletter right you bundle and you can sell ads or subscriptions have writers that cover different ones that are kind of like all sharing costs and generating revenue over different and you maybe have a subscriber that instead of just subscribing to one they subscribe to the main but also golf and football you want to get them like two, two to three i think is this sweet spot. I don't remember the exact number at Axios, but there was some number where it was like, once people start subscribing to too many of our newsletters, they actually become less engaged. Oh, it's really? like, yeah. Well, I think it makes sense, right? If, if you're getting like too much, you, you kind of tune it out. I think there's a sweet spot. The other thing I'd say about sports media that's unique is that, so there's two types, not two types of sports fans, but two ways, two major ways in which people follow sports in my mind. One is nationally, so that's one of the stories of the day in the same way is true for politics or anything else. You know, the big news that everyone's talking about around the water cooler kind of thing. And that's largely what I cover. But there's this whole other side of sports, which is fan specific team fandoms, right? So the way somebody follows sports news nationally is much more as like a reality. Sh they're following this reality show. They're following, you know, the same again, the same way you follow politics, just like what's the news of the day. Whereas if you're like, I'm a huge diehard Orioles fan. 
the way I follow the Orioles is completely different. The way mm. I follow the Orioles is almost more like a cult. <laughs> yeah. You know? So there's two very distinct ways to get to sports fans. One is nationally mm. and you know what a lot of people places do. And you look at some place like The Athletic, which does plenty of national, but their big value prop is you are obsessed with the Yankees. And we are, we were in the clubhouse. We got reporters on the ground. We got beat reporters on the ground. We're going to give you a thousand words on your like seventh reliever because we know his whole life story. And so, you know, your average sports fan, I'd say, is interested in nationally, you know, the headlines, they talk with their friends, aware of what's going on, but then they have these teams that they're diehard fans of that they follow in a completely different way that people would think would be, is like crazy sometimes. You know, you, like I said, you're like a cult member. So would there be a third, or maybe this is a part of the cult, just like regional sports? Like I'm in Detroit, or I'm, you know, I'm in Ann Arbor, which is close to Detroit. So I like the Red Wings, hockey. I like the Lions, football, Pistons, basketball. Like, is that kind of a third, or is that just the cult, probably? I would tie that into the latter, and maybe less of a cult, but you're right. Like there's a, a regional sense. I guess a, a better way to describe it would be there's two ways people follow sports. One is a, as a news consumer, and one is as a fan. Mm, right. Okay. So, you know, you're interested in what LeBron James is doing, but that doesn't mean you're a Lakers fan. Whereas you are super interested in what happened in the Red Wings game last night because you're from there. But if you lived in, let's say, Florida, you could care less probably. Yeah. And it's interesting too, with the internet, you start to realize, wow, the Lions suck. I have to cheer for other football teams. Yeah. It's been rough for the Lions, but they're on the, they're on the come up for sure, man. My stock in the Lions. Really? Okay. I, cause yeah. the, the way I kind of think about it, I play a lot of fantasy football. So I think about like, what are the most undervalued teams? I think I was thinking this going into the playoffs. This might have changed because they sorted it about was the Jaguars. I was like, oh, they're going to be really good next year. I think like Trevor, Trevor Lawrence could be a top five QB, which is kind of insane to say, but that's how you win in fantasy football. You take him at the very end. That's how you win at fantasy football. And now increasingly, that's how you win betting. I mean, that's what's really interesting about the rise of betting and fantasy football, which has been happening for a while, is that people can now treat sports more transactionally and more. It ties into this, especially among young fans of like, you know, you're already doing all this research. The analytics are much more uh, approachable now in ways they didn't used to be. And you have a lot of fans now like, I know more that, about you and I'm going to actually like act on that. Or even buying baseball cards is back, you know, like, yeah, you, know, true. like you think Trevor Lawrence, for example, like you said, fantasy football. If you think Trevor Lawrence is going to be a top five quarterback, buy his card, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. That's taking him. I also am regretting saying that because he's probably going to have a terrible year. <laughs> if people are going to call me up. <laughs> but but I will warn you, the NFL is, there's so much parody in the NFL, especially compared to some other leagues where, let's say the NBA. NBA, you can kind of see a good team building slowly. Mm. M NFL, from one year to the next, the Lions last year were a good example. Like the Lions were irrelevant. And then last year, out of kind of nowhere, they're very good. Um, yeah. That happens a lot in the NFL, uh, much more than than other sports. Yeah, I, I haven't actually looked, but I just, I'm thinking anecdotally, the Lions lost a lot of really close games, what I'm remembering. Like I went to the game where they played the Seahawks and it was the game, it was like 50 to 47 or something. Just every drive was like a 60 yard run or touchdown or whatever. It was fun to watch. It's also infuriating because it was like they just kept getting scored on. Their offense was very good. I think they had one of the most efficient offenses last year. Dan Campbell's the man. Is he? Okay. I don't, you you obviously follow him much closer than I do. Dan Campbell is like, you know, people use the word football guy to describe mm. people when they're, they're just like every stereotype you could attach to football. Like they're super intense. Mm. They're like push ups, you know, like that. That is, <laughs> that's like Dan Campbell to a T. He's like the okay. biggest football guy. Of all time. Well, I think what the Lions always had was just discipline, work ethic type problems where I don't know how that like if it's missing curfew, if it's just like not trying in practice or something, but a culture problem. You know, I think a lot yeah. of teams, even, even even though the Lions, for example, their roster now compared to five years ago or 10 years ago is obviously like completely different players. Everything's completely different. There's still cultures that develop around franchises. You look at the uh, Miami Heat's a good example in the NBA. You know, their roster right now, there's not a single player other than Udonis Haslam, who was also on the, on the team when LeBron and the big three were there. So it's not a case of the people there, but the culture of the Miami Heat can stay consistent. Consistent, and that's because they have certain things you, they just drill into you. They are known to practice harder than other teams. Like there's cultures that get built within franchises, even though the players themselves come in and out. Interesting. And I, I mean, I know we have a lot of kind of founders of companies that listen to this. It's probably like it's a tone from the top kind of a thing. Okay, so we really got sidetracked there. So you had this idea for daily sports newsletter, moved to San Francisco, got the job at the hustle. You kind of talk about this. You pitched the idea of doing it. How did that go? How did you convince them? Because it wasn't the model. It was kind of a crazy idea, honestly. Yeah. Um, I think so. So what we did basically was 
launched it as a side project. So we kept doing what we're doing. And then we kind of launched this newsletter on the side and got, you know, thousand people to sign up. Like we published it for like a month. And the feedback we got over that month was so profoundly positive that really convinced everybody to pivot to that as our business model. Like I said, the hustle, which now a lot more people know, five people were in there. We were, we were, we were in this room in an, an apartment. So Pivoting the business, while certainly risky in some respects, it wasn't like this huge undertaking. It was like, all right, instead of writing blogs, we're just going to like put our stuff in this newsletter and send it. And then we'll figure out how to monetize it and do all that stuff. Okay. So then how do you write a daily newsletter? Because I write a newsletter slowly throughout the week. It sounds like a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And obviously, most daily newsletters are news news centric, right? So you're kind of at the mercy of the news cycle. And sports is impossible. Because my colleagues who write about the markets, for example, or the market closes, they can have a normal life. Whereas I, as much as I'd love for the newsletter to be done at 7 p.m., it's sports hasn't even started yet. Yeah. I say this, writing a daily newsletter, and anybody who's done so can attest to this, is very much of a lifestyle. You know, people ask me all the time, how many hours does it take you to write this? I have no clue because I don't have a normal work routine. It's very much like, yes, I have certain stories that are evergreen enough that I can write days in advance and get those done and kind of have them ready to go. But so much of what I'm doing is responding, reacting to the news that it's really, if something happens at 10 p.m., I kind of have to be on. Now, the nice part about that is that I'm not expected to break that story right away. So if something happens, at 10 p.m. I don't have to like get a story up immediately. I can get it done for tomorrow morning. But I guess I'd say about the rough daily workflow of a daily newsletter is having a really good system to follow the news. So like I use, I've built this and I've shared this many times on Twitter and things, X. Yes, it's um, known now. Is my RSS feed. So RSS Obviously, very old technology, but I've built this RSS feed that is invaluable to what I do. It has every source that I would ever read. It has Twitter has now pulled the API, so I can't do that anymore. But I had like all my favorite Twitter accounts. I have subreddits, newsletters, like every source of information that I could possibly need, I have in one feed. And that allows me to constantly stay on top of what's going on. It's honestly like if I miss a story, it's on me. It's not because I happen to not see it. It's there. I just have to scroll through. It's almost like, mm. think about it as an email inbox. If every sports story of the day comes into your email, it makes it very easy for you to make sure you don't miss anything. And so I rely on that very heavily, You know, refreshing that throughout the day. What's the product name? Uh, Reader, R-E-E-D-E-R. It's, you know, there's just some others that do fairly, fairly similar things, but this is synced across all my devices. You know, You can read all the articles within there. It actually allows you to link your pocket as well, or any other like tool you use to save stuff. So I can't tell you how like intuitive and easy this system that I've created for me is where I'm reading stories throughout the day and anything that's interesting, I immediately pocket it. And then when I go into write, write later, it's all saved right there. It really, I tell people like I can read the internet in a way that I control the spigot and I'm never overwhelmed. So a lot of, the, my, a lot of my routine is just kind of staying up to date and constantly seeing stories and pulling those off to the side and kind of saving them or immediately writing about them, feeling out the news of the day and and deciding how to take all of that and organize it and give it to my readers in a way that's very easy for them to digest. Interesting. Okay. So what was the point then when you decided, I've learned enough about newsletters, I'm going to do my own thing? Uh, so it was a little over a year after the at the hustle, and it was when I had that realization. You know, I, I still had that idea, sports in the back of my head, wanted to do a sports newsletter that, that never left. But when I actually found myself personally realizing I could use that product because I all of a sudden wasn't following news the way I could, I was like, I, I got to do this. And the process of writing a sports newsletter is going to get me back into sports, which I miss. Everything was like pointing me in this direction. It was almost incumbent upon me to do it. Yeah. So how did you how did you start it? Like how do you start a newsletter? We all see people starting them now. If we are on Twitter or LinkedIn, what was the process of starting one back in 2016, 17 when you did it? So the process was certainly not what it is now because the tools that exist now just weren't there. So I used MailChimp. The one thing I did, which I would still recommend anybody launching a newsletter do, is I was very open to trying different formats. My goal was, okay, so I want to co- I wanted to write a daily sports newsletter and I have this idea of like sports center in an email in my head. But what does that mean? What does that look like? How many items is it? And I didn't want to just assume that I knew best. So I, I think in the first month and a half of writing Sports Internet, I probably sent 
12 to 15 different formats. Really? Like I just kind of experimented. There's many different ways to cover the news of the day format wise. And so I kind of threw everything out there, got feedback from people. Also just personal feedback of like, how was that? Was that easier? Was that harder to do? That was definitely a big part of launching it was quite literally just trying a bunch of stuff publicly and then adjusting it and tweaking it and finally kind of arriving at a format that I felt people liked. And I also felt was repeatable enough for me that I could see myself doing that over and over and over and over and you know, finding this balance of like a rubric to some extent, but also enough freedom still to not, not feel like I'm just like plugging in information into this rubric. But I think that's a, a big part of designing a daily newsletter for people is finding the balance of, you know, giving yourself this framework that you, when you're reading the news are like, oh, that would be perfect for this section, but also not pigeonholing yourself where if something happens, you're like, well, I don't have a section to, you know, you have to have enough freedom to not be a slave to your own format. Yeah, because I'm trying to remember, I, I think what you, you really ended up hitting on was like the one, two, three, you had like 10 yeah. sections, basically, or was it maybe different number each and time? Funny enough, I was inspired by Axios, who later acquired the newsletter. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And uh, part of my thinking there, again, inspired by them, and so I assume they had the same thinking, was there's something really nice for a reader, especially when they're on the phone and they can't see much above or below what they're reading. If it's numbered, they have a sense of like where they are in it. So there's something, there's something kind of like comforting about like, oh, I'm on five, there's five left to go. Six, you know, you, you kind of, it, it gives a sense of place. And these are the kind of like detailed things that I obsessed over for so long. Ultimately with, with Axios, we literally said at the top of every newsletter, this newsletter is five minutes. This is how many words it is, this is how long it's going to take. I think it's just a small thing, but a big thing for a reader to kind of feel like they know what's coming. So then how did you get people to start, you know, reading? You kind of talked about it. it's, it's easier now than it was back then. How do you get... Because I, I'm trying to think of how I found it. I think it was an ad in another newsletter. Did you ever do anything with Market Snacks from Robinhood? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I think that's yeah. probably where I found it. Hopefully that was early. It was early. So the main way to grow back then, I mean, a- outside of paid acquisition, was simply doing cross promotions with other newsletters. And as crazy as it sounds now, this was what, five years ago, there weren't that many. Oh, really? Okay. There weren't that many. So it was like, oh, Market Snacks, I got introduced to those guys. You know, they had a bigger following than me because I was just starting out. So we worked out like, I'll shout you out, you know, for a week, you give me a shout out tomorrow. Did the same thing with Morning Brew. I'll give you guys a shout out for like a month that you give me one shot. You know, we kind of figuring out like, how is this a fair, a fair trade off? That was really effective. And so a big learning that I had early on, and this is kind of connected to that was, like I did a few cross promotions with sports related Instagram pages or the content of it was sports, but it wasn't a newsletter. And then I did cross promotions with Morning Brew and Marcus Next, which was the content was not sports, but it was a newsletter. And the latter was so much more effective. And my conclusion was that newsletter reader was a demographic. I tell people all the time, it's somebody who reads the news, uh, somebody who reads newsletters already, if you think about it, it's like they already get the newspaper, right? They already have, they already, the newspaper already comes to their driveway every morning by saying, hey, would you like to read my newsletter? Or essentially all you're asking them to do is, would you like to add another section to that newspaper you already get in the morning? Would you like to add a sports page? You already get the newspaper. Would you like to add a sports page? Oh, that's sure. I'll try that out. Whereas if you find a sports fan on an Instagram page and you say, hey, I have a sports newsletter, even if they love sports, you're still asking them to subscribe to the newspaper, which is a much bigger leap. They're like, well, I don't get the newspaper and I don't know if I have the time to read. So that was a really big learning early on was regardless of what the content is, if somebody reads a newsletter, there's a decent chance that they'll try yours out. Yeah. And I think there's demographics too, like even Instagram versus Twitter, Twitter is very text-based. So, you know, those people probably are more reading versus the Instagram audience. They might not even have Twitter or the email app on their phone. It's very true. And I think maybe becoming less true because newsletters are much more ubiquitous, but especially back then, if somebody doesn't read newsletters already, like trying to convince them to sign up for one, they're like, I don't even use my email, man, or you know, whatever. It's like, it's just... You yeah. have a foreign idea, like, well, you're gonna, I'm gonna read an email from you, like, yeah, it's an interesting thing we're coming up to now. Like, I've heard some murmurs or seen stats about Gen Z and email, like, they don't check them, like, you gotta hit them on Snapchat or something, or like TikTok. It's so interesting to me with email is that I think we can all agree that it's a very effective medium for newsletters. It's been apparent for a while and continues to become more and more apparent every time somebody says email is dead. It's like, well, it's actually better than ever. However, I think we can also all agree that there are limitations to it. And young people is a perfect example. I, you know, Most high schoolers do not use their email, let alone have one. Um, even in college, you get an email, which is, which is great, but do you really check it? I mean, I didn't use my email much in college. So there is a certain 
downside to getting young people to read newsletters is, is tough. However, the thing that I always tell people is like, I believe in email as a medium and newsletters as a medium. But if Apple made it possible to send rich text messages, so like if I could essentially send my newsletter to you via text, and let's say you get a message from me and you hold your thumb down and it opens the whole newsletter. Basically, if there was a way for me to get give you the same experience you get from me via email, but in a text message, I would do that. Email is the perfect way to do this right now. And that's why email is never going to die. But if you could keep the same benefits of email in a place that you know more people use, younger people use, like it's very interesting, like this push and pull of email. If something comes to replace it, I'll jump there immediately. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I would, I don't know, I would bet you, I don't know what the time is, but I don't know if I want to say five or 10 years, but I do think that's going to happen. If you kind of look at what Apple's been doing, they've been starting to build out this advertising network. When you think about they've made it harder for Facebook to track ads, like they're planting all the seeds. And again, we're going to get in this a little bit later with their content business. You monetize content with advertising. I think iMessage is one of those sleeping kind of content products or like iMessage could have been what Snapchat is or there's a lot that they can do with it. It'll be interesting to see. I would bet within the next five or 10 years, you'll be able to do something. I've seen a couple newsletters experiment with text. I experimented with text as well. I think there's a certain balance of email, especially in a daily email. If I get Mm -hmm. a daily text, I think I would like within a month be like, all right, stop texting. You know, (laughs) that's only like a balance to strike there where email is like, you can still get to people where they can kind of tune it out a little bit more. But the bottom line is, and I this is what this is how I think about newsletters is newsletters, just like texts, just like DMs on Instagram, Twitter, you know, whatever. It's all messaging. And that's really what's effective. What's effective is messaging. What's effective is you're coming to them. They don't have to find you. They don't have to seek you out. You're coming to them at a consistent time and you're coming to them in an app that they check all the time. So if I send you my newsletter, it pops up on the top of your phone the same way if I texted you. The only difference is when you click it, you're opening a different app. And it's probably too that you get a rich, you know, HTML format in email right. versus text is just, you know, text. Right, exactly. But then also okay. it's cross platform where you could be on your phone or on your computer versus Instagram. No one checks that on their computer. You know, you see um, even Substack did this, which uh, I always, I thought was a mistake, but there's also benefits to it. So I get it. But like for the last six years, there've been so many attempts by people to say, oh, like people are really into newsletters, but it's not the ideal experience to read those newsletters in the same inbox that you have all this other email and stuff and promotions. Maybe we just create a separate app just for newsletters. And I and I get it. I totally understand. But like what you're missing there is the biggest benefit of newsletters is that it is, it is in your inbox because that's one of four apps that everybody checks all the time. The chances of you getting me to start habitually opening a new app. I mean, I can't tell you the last time I adopted a new app. Maybe Threads, which I which I'm slowly. You know how hard it is to get somebody to add a new app to their routine. Everybody checks email. If you look at everybody's screen time, like email is probably at the top of every working professional's list of apps they open most. Are you actually using Threads too? By the way, not really. I'm starting to a little bit. Interesting. Okay. My assumption was, I mean, I use it, the content sucks. It's just Instagram, but text, but Facebook will get us to use it slowly. Of course. And what's funny for me is, and I think this is probably true for a lot of journalists or, or people who write and, and have an audience for a living is for so long, like Twitter for me was like, that's where I am, that person. And then Instagram is like, my Instagram followers are like my friends from high school, which is a completely different audience. And so the only way for threads to make sense for me is if I get enough of that audience that I have over here to move over, that's easier said than done. So what what was the business model then when you started Sports Internet and kind of as you scaled it up? Was it sponsors? Because I don't even remember. Sponsors. It was just me and uh, selling sponsors was hard. And um, I had so much, I was just like stretched so thin that ideally I would have had you know, different daily sponsors or at least weekly. But I ended up signing like longer term deals for less money, nice. but just to like make it easier for me, just do like a month of advertising. So yeah. I first I actually have the check right here. Uh, Amazing. Can we see it? Uh, I kept it. Yeah. Well, it's in the, uh, it's under the table. So it'd be hard to see. Oh, God. But okay. It was, uh, my first deal was with uh, FanDuel. Oh, interesting. That's a good one. It was a result of a bunch of people from FanDuel reading it. Um, and then I kind of solicited ads and they got back to me and made a lot of sense. So that's awesome. That was my first advertiser and it was like a month long deal. And I think it was, wasn't much. Again, I was just very early. I probably had like 5,000 subscribers. So I think probably if I had to guess, let me actually look. Let's see what exactly it was. Yeah. Okay. It was $2,000. Actually, so th- this I think was for two weeks. Yeah. $2,000 for two weeks. Okay. So 10 emails for 2,000 bucks. So they 
two hundred bucks an email on five thousand yeah. subs. And for me at that point, FanDuel was a big enough name that for me, almost that that advertising deal was more like legitimizing what I was doing. I think there was something to be said for having sponsored by FanDuel in very early on solo person doing a newsletter that kind of gave it a sense of like legitimacy. And I think that, you know, that's true for a lot of early advertisers. Like there's benefits beyond just the revenue. Obviously the revenue is most important, but there's certain companies that are known enough that immediately make their ears perk up like, oh, this person's legit, you know? I mean, they're social proof. I mean, people, you see that all over the place. Like, hey, you should read my newsletter because LeBron James subscribed to my newsletter. FanDuel's a sponsor. We've broken this story about a trade. All those things, people are like, holy shit, like we got this is a this is real. This is a legit newsletter. So then how did you kind of evolve that over time? Like, were you ever in a spot where you're like, I'm okay? Or is it the whole time you're just like, I need to figure out how to make money. I gotta get this new issue out. Were you getting any sleep? What did your days look like then when you were writing this thing? Yeah. I was not getting much sleep. It was, you know, continued to be ad backed. Um, I, ha- I developed a secondary ad where I created this game called The Gauntlet, where it was essentially like a pick em. So I'd have a question at the bottom of the newsletter starting on Monday, like, will Bryce Harper hit a home run tonight? Yes or no? And I would see who clicked yes and who clicked no. And then depending on what happened, if you got it right, you'd move on. If you got it wrong, you'd be eliminated. How did you do that? I think I remember that. The, the reason why I didn't keep doing it was because it literally made my life so hard because I had to go see who clicked yes, go see who clicked no. And then I would create the newsletter the next day, but I create two versions, one to send to the cohort that said yes. And one to send to the cohort that says no. And I had to keep doing this every day until I got to Friday. It was the cool. It was awesome. I, I thought it was so cool, but I was like, I can't keep doing it. But I, but I did have that sponsored and the sponsorship was like, depending on how you did, the, the higher the like discount you got. It was with a company called Wolico. It makes like athletic clothing. And it's like, if you got all the way to the end of the gauntlet, you got 25% off. If you got like one right, you got 10% off. So I tried to gamify like the ads. It was I, I thought it was an awesome thing. I would love to bring it back if I could figure out how to automate it or just have somebody like doing it. That's not me. But that was kind of how I was monetizing it. I, I didn't think I was going to make it profitable just by myself. My goal when I set out and launched it was definitely to hit a certain milestone, which in my mind was 25,000 subscribers. And then I was going to go raise money and hire people and build out a whole business. So like that was that was my goal, hit 25,000 subscribers. And obviously before that could happen, ended up selling it to Axios, which we can what is that like getting acquired? Well, it was interesting because it's like getting acquired as one person with one newsletter. So like very different than acquiring a business with a lot more assets or a lot more employees. It was really more of an aqua hire. The one thing that I think really worked in my favor, I made a very intentional decision early on because I figured this could maybe happen was I never spent a single dollar on paid acquisition. And, and so what I think that allowed me to do is tell more of a story when I was getting acquired, like as opposed, like if I had spent money acquiring emails and I had a maybe bigger list as a result of that, but my open rate was probably was going to be then lower because I was getting subscribers in a in less organic way. I think the negotiation with Axios would have been more of a math equation. It would have been more like, hey, you have 17,000 subscribers. Each subscriber we value at this amount of money and therefore this is how much we're going to buy you for. Whereas I was able to say to them, let's forget the number of subscribers My open rate is 63%, which it was. And so the story I was able to tell, which I think a lot of business and a lot of when it comes to acquisitions is what's the narrative? What story are you telling? My story was you're not buying 17,000 emails. You're buying a community of people who are obsessed with this product who, when I don't send it out for a week, which happened one time because I was on vacation and I didn't Mm -hmm. communicate it well enough, people freaked out. (laughs) Uh, Okay. And two thirds of them open every single edition. That allowed me, I think, to tell a completely different story. And I think it helped in the negotiation, get a higher uh, multiple for it, quite frankly. Did they acquire the email list? Yep. So they acquired the email list. So it was an aqua hire. So they basically acquired my email list. You know, that was like a separate transaction. And then they hired me to come over and continue doing it. The reason why I ended up going there, well, many reasons. One being, I just thought it was a great fit. Like I said, they had inspired my format. They really were newsletter first in a way that few media companies were and still are. I felt they really understood newsletters. They spoke newsletter, if you will. And also I was so broke and so burned out. And I think one realization I had, and this happened like less than a year after I started it, Mm. but one realization I had had over that time was entrepreneurial as I am. And as much as I want to like build a business, run a business, I was having so much more fun writing the content. And what Axios or any company at that time was basically offering me was, let's let you do that and we'll do all this other stuff. Yeah, because they probably helped you sell ads, right? 
I'm assuming you didn't have to think about that anymore. Exactly. Like just the fact that I'd never had to think about, like, like think about that again, at least in that role. And I just felt like I was, I was doing so much and then like trying to pour myself into this content, but just the idea that like, what, what could I do if that was my sole focus? I feel like this is really working. I feel like people are really liking this, but I also feel like I'm just scratching the surface on what I'm putting into it because I just only have so much time. It, it just felt like the right move. Okay, so two questions. What is a good open rate and click-through rate just for other people interested in newsletters? And then how do you sell sponsorships for a newsletter? So good open rate, I guess, is up for debate. I mean, the industry average, I believe, is like 17%. So is this like news newsletters or is this just like even that's why it's kind of misleading because i think so many like kind of tie email marketing and newsletters into the same bucket email marketing is like a lot of that is just spam it's crap whereas a lot of newsletters are like editorial media products totally different thing all under the same umbrella that's probably a misleading number i mean i would say the average of newsletters is probably like 30 percent, maybe yeah. that might even be high there's a lot of bad newsletters out there just like there's a lot of bad podcasts and everything <laughs> Okay. Um, I think so. I would say if you're over forty percent, you're doing a good job. That's good. Good news for me. I'm a, I'm higher than that. Yeah. Not that I mean, much higher. I'm not sixty three. No, but I think I, I think yeah, sixty three was unheard of. Yeah, that's actually uh, insane. Based on I think the highest I've ever seen is seventy seven percent, but it was like a three thousand person list or something. Yeah. Super niche and curated. Mine was. The exact numbers, 63.2% open rate. And I had almost 18,000 subscribers. To be clear, to maintain that, like I could have had a lot more subscribers, but I like clean the list quite frequently. So like oh, did you? every okay. few weeks, yeah, every few weeks I'd see if this person hadn't opened, sometimes I'd email them be like, hey, do you want this? And, you know, maybe it was going to their spam or something. They didn't realize it. You know, it, it, was, it was very manual and kind of took a lot of time and maybe it wasn't worth it. But I think ultimately it was to like really focus on the open rate. Because going back to what I said, like telling that story, if I had 25,000 subscribers and a 50, 50% open rate versus 18,063, I think that tells a very different thing. And it's ultimately what's is 8,000 emails going to be that much more valuable that you're not able to tell that story or not. So I'd say anything over 40%, I think is very good. And, and so for somebody who's not familiar with newsletters or like how the business works, open rate is important because why? Uh, you're essentially telling advertisers, this is how many people you can expect to see this. And it also just is a great you know, measure of just general like engagement. If you have a million subscribers, 20% open rate, it's like, all right, you have a lot, a lot of people like are signed up for this thing, but not that many people really care. Only 200,000 are actually opening it. Yeah. Right. Whereas if you have 400,000 subscribers and 50% open rate, it's the same number of people seeing it. And it's like ooh, way more engagement. So yeah, to your question of like, how do you sell ads? What info do, do advertisers want? I mean, I think there's two... You know, there's more than this, but generally speaking, there's two types of ads being sold in newsletters these days. One would be a brand awareness campaign. So that's simply, hey, we want to be attached to your content. We think you're doing a great job. You know, your audience would like what we're doing. And really what they're paying for is just a spot in the newsletter. Often they'll have some sort of click through, like they want people to go to their site or to buy something, but the deal itself is not structured around clicks at all. It's just, we're paying you this money for this done deal. And then you obviously have to report back to them and this is how many people opened it, whatever. But then there's also deals that are structured around clicks. Like performance so, based or something. Performance ads, exactly. Yep. They, we call them performance ads where that's usually, you know, DTC companies or companies with products and they want to sell a specific thing and you're getting paid out. Usually it's a lot of times you'll structure it with like a flat fee up front, but then, you know, that fee's relatively lower and then you're getting paid based on either just straight number of clicks or number of people who actually purchase. Just like any any sort of kind of affiliate deal. It's pr pretty straightforward. You know, if you send 100 people to buy shoes and 80 of them buy the shoe, like they're going to give you a cut of each of those sales, essentially. When you start to kind of think through some of these numbers, a fairly large newsletter list can be a pretty lucrative business where you write one email, 300,000 people open it and read it. You drove, let's say, 500 people to buy a product. And you're getting paid, you know, 10 bucks per purchase that you yep. drove or per click. You wrote one email and you could make $10,000. That's yep. a pretty, the, the math on that, like the, it's, it's, a, it's, they're good businesses. They can be. They're really good businesses. You could keep them really lean. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of people start newsletters as one person or two person or three person companies is because you run yep. the numbers. If you do a good job, it's a profitable business pretty quickly. And even if you compare it to podcasts, which I would put in a similar bucket of just lean business, cash flow positive businesses. To start a newsletter is 
way cheaper than a podcast. You don't have to buy any equipment. I mean, a good podcast microphone is a pretty good chunk of change. There's a lot of things you can do to improve sound. You know, most people nowadays are going to film the podcast. There's a lot more to it. Whereas to start a newsletter, you need, you know, a Beehive or a Substack or, or some way to send those newsletters. You need a computer. Yeah, you could type from your phone. And Substack is free when you start. You don't have to pay. So I mean, when I was doing sports internet, which is what I sold to Axios, like I think my monthly costs uh, strictly related to the business which, you know, ended up entailing some other things because I did have a website and I did have some other things, but it was like probably like 200 bucks. Which, as we talked about, you made that from sending one email was about 200 bucks. Yeah. So they can have pretty good margins. I think they get a little bit of a bad rep sometimes when people like especially venture investors will say media companies are bad venture investments. It's because to your point, you can't just blow it up super quick with the typical venture playbook. But when you're like Bloomberg is one of the it's a private company, but it's a massive business. It's basically a media company that's vertically integrated, selling people twenty thousand dollar a year subscriptions for like a special keyboard and like some data. I mean, like you look at some of the most successful uh, newsletter companies did not have to raise much money because you just quite frankly don't need it. I think uh, when the investment comes in, venture or otherwise, is usually when the newsletter has had some level of success, created some level of community, and there's obvious pathways to find more revenue streams for that community, whether it's events or whatever else. The investment is based on the community you've built through the newsletter. And now like what else can we do? And so one of the companies I invested in personally was is essentially like a newsletter holding company called Workweek. I don't know if you've seen them, but they've started launching some software products. So all their newsletters are B2B. And I think the first one that they've kind of announced publicly, it's a franchise newsletter. I'm not going to get the number, but it's tens of thousands of basically franchise owners, people who own Burger Kings and McDonald's. And there's thousands of these different restaurants and retail and landscaping businesses that you can, you know, essentially borrow the brand name and open your own vocal version of it. And so now what they're doing is they're launching software related to people who run franchises. So obviously they're monetizing with advertising and usually what they'll what they'll do if you subscribe and read the newsletter, the ads in the newsletter are hey, open like a Krispy Kreme franchise or open like a dog grooming franchise. So very relevant and targeted ads. But then they're also like, hey, pay 100 bucks a year, a month, whatever the price is for the software to help you run your franchise better. I don't know what direction they'll go. But when you think about when you think about some of that math, it was like, OK, they might acquire a newsletter reader for two, three, four dollars. They'll profitably serve them the advertising business. But then suddenly there's a software business that maybe makes thousands of dollars a year per customer and they acquired them for $2 in the newsletter. And I think that it, 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 you're, you're exactly right. And I think that that model, we're only the tip of the iceberg of that because it is true that especially right now, the ad market's pretty soft and any media company that's strictly ad backed and has no other sources of revenue is not a good idea. But I think with Workweek and what they're doing specifically to what you talked about speaks to what I said before, which is you can just build a really strong connection with people with a newsletter more so than even like a blog. Like you think about um, if their franchise guy was just writing all of the same content he's writing in that newsletter, but on a blog, plenty of people would still seek that blog out and end up reading the stuff. But like there's something about the fact that they're getting that consistently and they're just like, they, they, there's a relationship that's developed there that's just kind of hard to explain. But then when you when it comes to time, you want to sell them more things. Like it's just that you're able to create a community so much quicker and in such a more profound way through this newsletter. And it kind of seems simple, but it's true. And the newsletter is also a blog. Like you can go read the newsletter online too. So you know, what, what, it's funny you say that. Like one thing um, I tell people all the time, like, you remember, uh, you know, like before people started doing newsletters, this this as much as they are now, you'd have a WordPress, you do a blog, and then on WordPress, there was always the option to like send this blog as a newsletter, as an email as well. And I feel like we just basically flipped that. And it makes so much sense because in this era where everybody's overwhelmed with stuff and you're typically opening your phone, going to a social media network and just you start scrolling aimlessly and there's no intention behind what you're doing. Why would you put your content somewhere where people have to seek it out? And then maybe they get it via email. Why not just send it via email? And then they can also seek it out. In hindsight, it's like so obvious that people would choose to write a newsletter that's also a blog now than have a blog that is also a newsletter. Yeah, and when I kind of think about what are what are the apps or the properties, the digital properties that people go and seek out, it's usually some kind of aggregation product, whether it's Twitter, 
Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, even like Netflix is again, aggregation, maybe games. If you love Candy Crush, maybe that's an example. But yeah, it's very rare. I just think about myself and I think this is true for a lot of people. Like I rarely go to websites. I really like intentionally decide to go find something. I mean, the only time I'm doing that is like a Google search, right? We've all almost trained ourselves in this social media era to like, open our feed, and then we kind of know we'll find something eventually. And maybe you end up going down a rabbit hole, but there's very little intention anymore. And so I think the way to kind of break through that is to come to them as opposed to rely on them to find you. Yeah. But then you probably also want to make sure that you're not solely reliant on just email as a channel or just Instagram, just Facebook. Media companies have run into that problem. So you almost want like a multi-pronged. And again, it's like multi, not just multi-business model where you've got sponsorships, events, subscription recruiting software, but also like, hey, we've got email, SMS, text. We have a bunch of people on Instagram to pull them in, a bunch on TikTok, Twitter. So if if like one thing goes down, you still have multiple hooks and things to bring people in. The only thing I'll say to that, which is kind of counter to that point, but not really, but like it's just advice to anybody starting a newsletter is I do feel like it's kind of the default mode to just, let's say you launch a newsletter, like, of course, we need a, we need a Twitter page and a Facebook and Instagram. We need all these things. And I found that especially when you're early on and you probably don't have the, the bit, that huge audience, I think you're actually better off not like, let's say you, you have a Twitter and you have five followers. I think it's actually better for you to not have a Twitter. Why, why publicly make it clear that you no one really. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and also, I think you need more of a strategy first. I think a lot of people just launch all these social platforms and don't really have a plan. I think it, end, you end, it ends up doing you a disservice. I think you know if you launch a newsletter, maybe maybe you also have an Instagram page, but be very intentional about like, well, what is that? You re- maybe there's one section every day that you also have on Instagram. And sometimes I think people just their default mode is just like we need to have all these things, but there's no plan. It's just like we have them and we'll figure it out. Maybe this is a good way to segue. You recently left Axios. Now you're going to Yahoo. Yahoo's a really interesting business because I forget the stat. I think it's like the third most visited web property or something. I think it's like six or something, but whatever it is, it's a lot of people. Billions, billions of users a month. What was your thought process on going from Axios? It's kind of this sexy newsletter first media company. I think they just got acquired, right? Axios did. So now you're going to Yahoo, fallen angel. You know, maybe you're in the middle of a turnaround. I'm not sure, but I'll let you dive into it. But what was the thought process? Because that seems like a crazy move on the surface. So the thought process was a few things. One is, I agree with you. I think Yahoo is in a really interesting spot. And I think ultimately it's a rocket ship. I'm really a big believer in the leadership there now. So that's obviously a big part of it. They just hired uh, Ryan Spoon as the president of Yahoo Sports. He's really well-respected around the sports media industry, worked at ESPN. So a big fan of his, a big fan of the CEO of Yahoo, Jim Lanzone. Um, so that's, you know, first and foremost, I think, anytime you're looking to go to a new company, if you really believe in the leaders and the people who are going to be calling the shots, what's more important than that? I also think that, you know, you think about, okay, I'm in the business of uh, newsletters and email. Yahoo literally has email. There's clear synergies there. It's the second biggest still behind Gmail. I mean, there's some stats by Yahoo that people don't realize. The second most visited sports property on the internet behind ESPN. Like we said, sixth biggest website, um, second biggest email uh, service behind Gmail. Yahoo Finance, I think, is number one in finance. Like it's a huge audience. So a lot of thinking, so that's some of the thinking. The other thinking was audience, right? My goal with this newsletter is to build the biggest sports newsletter, if not just newsletter period in the world. And we're not there yet. At Axios, I think uh, we're in the hundreds of thousands of readers. I want to I want to get the millions. And a place that already has millions of readers feels like a great place to do that. The other thing for me just personally was as much as I enjoyed being the sports team at Axios, me and my uh, colleague, Jeff Tracy, who wrote this newsletter, like we were the sports department at Axios. And that was really cool in some respects. Like we were, you know, it was not competing for stories. We were the sports desk. But what excites me about Yahoo is like, now I'm going to be surrounded by tens and almost a hundred other sports reporters and kind of able to work with them, able to share a lot of their content in my newsletter. And so I just think as somebody who's obsessed with sports and just loves sports the way I do, to be surrounded by colleagues who share that same passion as me is I think hopefully going to ignite a lot more passion in me um, as I continue doing this. And so I think it just makes a lot of sense for me um, as I continue this journey, kind of, you know, I think in some respects, it's kind of hitting the ceiling at Axios in terms of, okay, covering sports at a place where sports is not 
the focus and Axios. I think we have one of the biggest sports news- newsletters out there, but no matter how big that newsletter got, Axios was never going to be thought of or known for sports. For me, it's like, I want to go to a place where the sky is the absolute limit. And I think uh, Yahoo presents that opportunity. Yeah, because I kind of think about too, where does Yahoo rank in, in terms of fantasy platforms? Are they pretty high on that too? Right up there with the SQL. Yep. Okay. It's an interesting time for you to be joining because fantasy season is going to ramp up. How do you think about then like launching, like does Yahoo have a sports newsletter? Yeah, Yahoo has a sports newsletter. We're going to see how how we uh, leverage that a, a, a moving forward. But I mean, the bottom line is uh, Yahoo is a really big believer in what I've been doing, which is another reason why I feel confident going there. Like, you know, if I was going to a place where I really had to sell what I've been doing and point out, you know, why we should keep doing this, like I'm going to a place where like, no, we love what you're doing. Let's do it and let's make it even bigger and better. So that's really, really excites me. And, you know, you mentioned fantasy. I think betting kind of works into that too. It's all kind of this part of the same like fandom, but interacting and not just make predictions, but actually act on those predictions. And I think Yahoo fantasy and betting are all intertwined there. Yahoo has Yahoo Sportsbook and fantasy. So I think incorporating that all into my sports coverage, which is kind of this daily touch point for sports fans. You know, for so long, I've basically been telling you the news. And now I think I would have a really cool opportunity to also intertwine betting and intertwine fantasy and all these other things in ways I haven't and just make that kind of daily experience for a sports fan much more engaging. Interesting. So are you starting a new newsletter product at Yahoo or are you like, what's going to happen? Yeah, new newsletter product, but I would kind of frame it as a continuation of this journey I've been on. So I started uh, a newsletter in my room in San Francisco, just on my own, and then went to Axios and built that up into a very large audience, kind of figured out, you know, what works, what doesn't. And now this, I'm kind of thinking about this as the next step in that and going after a much larger audience. And Axios Sports is essentially what can two people put together. And not to say that you need that many more people to do it well, but like, I'm excited to see what can two people, but with the support of an entire newsroom put together. And uh, there were so many times over the last five years when I was just like, if we had one more person, two more people think about what we could do, because I just simply couldn't do it all. You know, I, there were so many stories that like, oh, I would love to spend the next five hours reporting this out. But guess what? I have to like write five other things. And then that story falls through the cracks. Whereas now I'm going to have a lot more resources, a lot more support that I can do that story. And that will play itself out over and over and over. And I think the end result will just be a better product. Interesting. So, and I think you did have a really good product. What do you think you were able, or why do you think you were able to cut through the noise and get commissioners and sports VIPs to pay attention to you? And this is a, this is actually a question from, I would label them as like a VIP in the sports world. They wanted to remain anonymous, but what do you think you did right? So I'd say uh, there's a few things, but I'd say one that I definitely point to is from day one, my hypothesis was, I think you can combine sports news with sports business news, which is news about the industry of sports. And for so long and still to this day, those are very separate, right? It's like sports news is for the billions of fans around the world and sports business news is mostly for people who work in sports. A lot of that is like, you know, stuff about TV ratings and um, stuff we've talked about a little bit, like sports holding the cable package together, like the business of sports. And I always thought if you make that sports business stuff, interesting enough for your average sports fan, they're actually, it's actually really intriguing for them. So I just, from day one, I've combined them. Like I have some people who would consider my newsletter a sports business news- newsletter. I don't think that is the case. I think I have other, other people who consider my support, my newsletter a sports newsletter. So I've been able to combine the two. And I think the result is that you know, your typical sports fan who reads my newsletter. And I also have Adam Silver, the commissioner of NBA reads it. And I think for Adam, he gets sports news as he's a sports fan, but he also gets news about the industry that he's in and it's all in the same place. And it's all kind of, you know, when you combine them in the same place, I think you end up seeing, you're able to connect more dots and you're seeing, you know, if you're hearing, you're getting news about what that's relevant to sports fans and news that's relevant to sports executives, you kind of see the synergies between the two. And I don't think there's any reason why those have to be separate. Yeah. And to your point about, you know, Adam Silver reading, obviously he's probably, maybe he's getting some NBA news, but he's probably following like, oh, interesting stuff in golf or into another sport that I probably should follow, but I'm not as in the weeds. The benefit of having a newsletter where my value proposition to readers is like everything that is important in sports is going to be in here. If you're the commissioner of the NBA and you feel like, why aren't we in here today? Or like, why, I feel like we haven't seen as much coverage about us lately. Like if he trusts my judgment and I'm deeming there are not to be that many important NBA stories this week, for instance, maybe that's important to note. And maybe there's some reflection that can happen there. 
So I think anybody who uh, works in the business of sports, if they're seeing things mentioned a lot in my newsletter or they're seeing things not mentioned, it's a good reflection of what's really kind of hitting out there right now. What do you think is the most underrated or underreported story going on in sports right now? So so to be clear, this is definitely being reported. So m- many people might not agree this is underreported. I just think it's underreported because as much as it has been reported, I don't think you can report on it enough. And that is just the momentum that is happening right now in the U.S. around the sport of soccer. And I think you're seeing that in many uh, respects. Obviously, the women are in the World Cup right now. Messi coming over the MLS is huge. And it's all, th- there's a very intentional push around soccer right now in the lead up to the 2026 World Cup. This, the 2026 World Cup is going to be, we're going to break every viewership record. Yeah, I can, I'm calling that right now. You're, you're just seeing that event where three years out is mobilizing people at every level of soccer, from youth soccer to high school soccer to college soccer. And then you have things like Messi coming to MLS. There's just so much momentum. Um, I think you know for so long, we've called the big four sports, NFL, NBA, NHL, MLB. Uh, soccer has always kind of been the fifth one there. Now, I think if you, uh, not considering leagues, but sports, you know, basketball, football, hockey, soccer, soccer is actually above hockey um, and has been for a while. In terms of like participation rate? In terms of participation, interest. I mean, I, you know, many more Americans play youth soccer than, than hockey. MLS has long been seen behind NHL, which is true because the best hockey players in the world play in the NHL. Best hockey players in the world do not play in MLS. And uh, that's a result of soccer being, you know, the most popular sport in the world. And, you know, it's just a different situation. But I think Messi is such a big figure, is such a game changing signing for MLS that you're now like, I think the question of what are the big four leagues? Should it be big five like that? That's a huge question in sports. And I think MLS moving forward, like has a legitimate is legitimately in the conversation in a way they haven't been. So I just think overall just pay attention to soccer. And there's a very intentional effort at all levels of the sport right now to make 2026 as big of a success as it could possibly be. It's going to be the biggest World Cup ever. You cannot report enough on soccer over the next few years. It's interesting that we went from, I don't know, we did the last World Cup in literally like the desert, 150 degree heat, did made no sense. Now we're doing it like the US, it's just a probably a better environment to actually host the tournament, period. There's probably going to be a lot of money that's made. I'm talking about the business side of sports, there's going to be a lot of money that people dish out and spend. And- the field is going to be 48 teams. That's so many teams. Is that more than normal? Oh, yeah. These are 32. Oh, wow. So this is, yeah, it's like significantly bigger. I can't wait. And put me on record, every viewership record will be broken. And this is in, in an era where viewership for things, even sports, is going way down. The importance of live sporting events of that magnitude are just becoming more and more important. I mean, there's only so many events every year, like the Super Bowl, that everybody stops everything to watch. The World Cup, like you look at the uh, Women's World Cup right now in New Zealand and Australia, like the the women played at 3 a.m. last night. Like that's tough. Whereas when it's in the, the U.S. and the games are in prime time, I mean, it's going to be huge. Yeah. And then I think too, the the argument I saw when Messi came over, people were like, oh, he's retiring. He's securing the bag. It's like, he just won the World Cup. Like, he was like the MVP. Messi, Messi is still the best player on the field. Yeah. I think that was evident by him. In And this is why sports are the best, because they're just unscripted. And it's like, things happen that are just absolutely incredible. And I would put Messi's first MLS game, so hyped, could not be any more hyped, literally. And he comes on, and in his first game, in traditional fashion, he's always been known for his free kicks. He comes on and scores the game winner. I mean, you can't, you cannot script that. I mean, if somebody would have scripted that, people would be like, no, that's too unrealistic. Who is the most underrated athlete in sports right now? Any level, any sport, any country, who's most underrated? I would say within hockey circles, this is not true because within hockey circles, people are aware of this. But I think it, within sports world, more broadly, they're not. And so that's this is kind of a weird answer, but I think this is my answer. And it would be Connor McDavid is the most underrated player. And the reason why the reason why is I think we're seeing maybe the greatest hockey player of all time. This is a hot take because he's still very young and Wayne Gretzky uh, is somebody who lived. Uh, but I literally think like that's what we might be watching. And I don't think even some casual sports fans know who he is. Yeah. So for people who don't know, can you give us the quick? I, I do know as a Canadian, I know yeah. who he is, but 
Connor McDavid is the best player in the NHL right now, plays for the Edmonton Oilers. Who Gretzky also played for. Wayne Gretzky is probably objectively the best hockey player, at least by most objective measure, it was the best. Like this past season, Connor McDavid was doing things. And I, my newsletter is always full of like stats. And I can't tell you how many stats last year it was like Connor McDavid, first player to do XYZ since Wayne Gretzky. He's in a, a universe of his own, and Wayne Gretzky is often the only player that's ever done the things that he's doing. So he's the best player, absolutely no argument. Um, in the NHL right now. But I think, you know, for American sports fans, the fact that he plays in Edmonton, the fact that hockey is a very regional sport and like it's not national in the same way the NBA is. The NBA, regardless of who you root for or where you are, like you're going to hear about what LeBron James did last night. Okay. Just that's how the media cycle works. That's how NBA fandom works. But I, I just think there's a lot of people out there who just don't fully understand that maybe the best hockey player to ever live is currently playing. Why is he so good? Like, is he fast? Can he hit? Can he score? Pass? Is it just everything? He's all around. Just he's just really good at. Everything. I mean, I think if you could point to one thing that's just visibly like jumps off the screen the most is his speed, and that's you know in hockey like it's different from like soccer or basketball. Where it's like sprint speed and like skating speed is just like a skill. And when somebody is just faster than everybody else on skates, it's crazy to watch. And I think there's just highlight after highlight of Connor McDavid getting the puck. He's got three defenders in front of him. And then like two seconds later, he just just like weaved through that. The the puck is not uh, an inch away from his stick and it's just mind blowing to watch. So I'd say his speed is the one thing that stands out the most, but he's really all around just fantastic at everything. Who do you think is the most underrated athlete of all time? Oof, that's a great question. I might go with another like weird answer of like somebody who def- people definitely know is great. No, that's totally okay. Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan. Interesting. Yeah, I think Tim Duncan is one of those guys that when people make lists of like top 20 players of all time is rarely on that list because people don't like close their eyes and picture Tim Duncan highlight reels in the way they picture like Kobe Bryant highlight reels, uh, Wilt Chamberlain, because Tim Duncan's kind of boring. Athletes that just like win and like get it done and they're not like sexy oftentimes get underrated when they're playing, but most important, mostly and even more so after they're done playing because they kind of get lost. And the only time they really show up is in like record books and not. And I think a lot of times when we think about all time grades, the highlight reels that are like playing in our heads that we can like remember, it's not the stats. And I just think Tim Duncan is like the stats would support him being in the top 20 of all time, if not higher. And I just don't think he appears on enough of those lists. And I think that makes him extremely underrated. He just is one of the best winners in NBA history. And I I would put him up there for sure. And so Tim Duncan was, I think, either center, power forward. He was like the tall guy. He played for a team, the San Antonio Spurs. Did they win a couple championships? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he won multiple championships with multiple different um, supporting casts around him. At one point, he played with David Robinson, who was a fellow seven-footer. So his early career, they had like the Twin Towers going. Um, And then the more modern Tim Duncan was in the 2000s. People might remember the rivalry between the Spurs and the Heat. They kept meeting in the NBA Finals. And it was, you know, Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, who's from Argentina, Tony Parker, who's from France, and then Kawhi Leonard, early career before he went to the Raptors and subsequently the Clippers. That Spurs team was just 10 deep and just ball movement. It was just the ultimate team. I kind of remember, but that's a good point of them being just him being underrated. Last question. Do you have a like a CEO or a founder that you really look up to or really respect? Certainly a long list there. I don't know him and I don't know enough about him like in terms of his leadership style and things like that to really speak to that part of it. But for me, as somebody who is a sports writer, but also has always considered myself entrepreneurial, want to start a business someday. And I kind of did with Sports Internet, although it was just a one-person newsletter, so I don't really consider it that. I would say Bill Simmons, his career trajectory really speaks to me in terms of kind of balancing like being a voice and a writer and somebody who like speaks about sports, but also like thinks about sports media from a business perspective and what he was able to do going from being a writer at ESPN to starting Grantland, which is one of my favorite websites, to then starting The Ringer, ended up pivoting really hard into podcasts, selling that company to Spotify. That's just somebody who like speaks to my interest of mm-hmm. sports writing, sports media, but also the business of sports media. Yeah, he's he's done a really good job. I'm not a super, super close follower, but I've heard of him. So that probably yeah. means a lot. Hey, yeah, that does mean a lot. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Kendall, this has been great. Thank you for coming on. This is really interesting for people. Anyone interested in media, newsletters, sports, hopefully we we talked about a lot of interesting stuff. So thanks, man. This is awesome. I really appreciate you having me on and the uh, awesome conversation. Thank you for tuning into the Peel. A lot of takeaways from Kendall, and I personally learned a lot as someone who writes a weekly newsletter myself. 
If you want to support the show, the best ways, as always, are to leave a review wherever you're listening, like, comment, subscribe on YouTube, and share this with one friend who might like it. If you don't want to miss an episode, subscribe to the newsletter in the show notes, and you'll get new ones in your inbox the moment they drop. Thanks again for tuning in. See you next time.